Because just when you think you understand parenting, your kids change, right? It's not like you ever hold them at a certain place and, and you're like, now I get it. Like it's constantly changing. We try and control our kids with, you know, telling them what they should do, how they should do it. We use a lot of consequences if they don't. And, and a lot of that is based in safety. Don't run in the middle of the street, you know, things that we do just to make them keep them safe. But what we have to remember is our kids are only kids for a certain amount of time and that they're developing into adolescents and then teens and then young adults. And what we want to develop over time is a sense of connection so they can still hear us, not in necessarily giving advice, but so we can stay in relationship with them. Today, I'm very excited because I have a very special guest, Kathy Kasani Adams. Kathy and her husband, Todd, host the podcast called Zen Parenting Radio, which is a top 10 kids and family podcast on iTunes. And they're also the creators of Zen Parenting Conference, which is held in Chicago. I have been a subscriber and a regular listener of their podcast, and that's how I know Kathy. She's been featured several times in Parents Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and other publications. Kathy is a social worker, certified parent coach, former elementary school educator, and yoga teacher. She lives outside of Chicago with her husband, Todd, and their three daughters. Kathy is also the author of several books. Her most recent book, Zen Parenting, Caring for Ourselves and Our Children in an Unpredictable World, is coming out in February 2022. Kathy, I am incredibly excited and honored to have you as a guest today. Thank you for accepting my invite. Oh, Supreet, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor. So I'm just curious, how old are your kids? Um, my oldest daughter is 18. She's in college now. I had to drop her off two and a half months ago. It was rough. Um, and then my middle daughter is now 16. She's going to be 17 this month. So at the end of this month. And then my youngest daughter is 14. Wow. So you have 18 years of experience as a parent. I do. I so do. with all that experience, and also I'm sure you've uh, learned a great deal from other families as well, because you are a therapist and you've helped a ton of families. So from all that experience, yours and others, what would you say is the biggest parenting tip or advice that you could give to viewers? Um, so if, if there's just one thing that they remember to do, and even if they forgot everything else, they'll be fine. Got it. Oh gosh. I wish I could just like summarize it all into one word, but I will do my best. Um, I think the word that Todd and I use the most on Zen parenting radio is connection. And we use it to describe how staying connected to our children and staying connected to our partner. If we have a partnership and staying connected to all the ones we love is the most important thing because if you have a connection and a sense of trust, you can be heard, you can be seen, you can be recognized as somebody that, um, so I'll speak specifically to the parent child relationship. It will be very difficult for my children to hear what I say, respect what I say. And when I use the word respect, I don't mean just like do everything I say, but like believe that I am speaking in their self-interest um, unless I have built a sense of connection and trust with them. So a lot of times when we are parenting little ones, it can be a lot more easy to be, to act as if we're in control. And I'm using that in, in air quotes, like we try and control our kids with, you know, telling them what they should do, how they should do it. We use a lot of consequences if they don't. And, and a lot of that is based in safety. Don't run in the middle of the street, you know, things that we do just to make them keep them safe. But what we have to remember is our kids are only kids for a certain amount of time and that they're developing into adolescents and then teens and then young adults. And what we want to develop over time is a sense of connection so they can still hear us, not in necessarily giving advice, but so we can stay in relationship with them. And so connection, it's such a loaded word. I mean, Todd and I have been podcasting for 10 years and I don't know if we have ever really defined it well, because it's so nuanced and it's so different with each kid. You know, I have three daughters, like you said, and, and what connection means with each one of them is different, but that word, that word connection is really what the most important 
I mean, I can't think of a more important thing when it comes to parenting. Thank you. I love that. I agree. And I see this, uh, the theme of connection also echoed in your stories that you and Todd share on your podcast of how, you know, connecting before giving advice, for example, and connecting with your daughters. And that's actually one of my favorite things about your podcast is the real stories that you and Todd share from your own parenting journey. And also the fact that you both do not act as experts, but instead as uh, fellow students of parenting. And I think um, those are some of the things which um, which really uh, connected me with, with the both of you and your podcast. So I'm just uh, curious, what made you both want to start that podcast? Great question. So about, like I said, about 10 years ago, I wrote my first book. It was a self-published book that my only intention in writing it was to like, put out some essays about my experiences as a new mom. Um, gosh, it might've even been longer ago than 10 years ago. It's, I'm, you know, it's like even over a decade, uh, journaling and writing was my way to kind of talk through the challenges I was facing. Cause I had a huge identity crisis when I became a parent and I just didn't feel like anybody was talking about that. So I started writing about it and I put it together in a book and my intention was to give it to students or to give it to people who'd came, you know, who'd come, who'd come hear me speak or something like that. But it ended up having a little bit of traction where I was on a few shows, sometimes on the regular radio. And then I ended up being on what was called at the time a podcast, which I didn't even really know what that was, but I went on a podcast. And as I was speaking with this couple who, um, you know, were the hosts of this podcast, they said, you should do this too. You should like, this is an up and coming thing, you know, and they said, you should really do this. And they said, but if you're going to do it, do it with someone who you, so you can have a discussion partner because they're like to have, especially about things like parenting and relationships, you want to have a back and forth. You don't want to just have one perspective. You want to have a few. So I, even before asking Todd, I basically said, okay, I know who I'm going to ask to do it. I'm going to ask my husband. What's interesting is I signed him up before I asked, which was very uncool, but I also, <laughs> he didn't really have the background that I did, meaning he's not a therapist. He happens to be a coach. Now he's gone in a completely, like if you've listened to the show since the beginning, he's had all sorts of different interesting experiences where now he's working with men and he runs a men's group. But at the time he was just, uh, doing his regular job that he still does does today, but just very interested in all of this work and very interested. He's such a great communicator. He's such a great, um, friend and partner and dad. So he's, he's the person I talk through all these things with, obviously. So I totally, I, I literally walked upstairs, like from where I am now. And he was in the kitchen and I said, I totally just signed you up for something. Like you're going to do this thing called podcasting with me. And you know, it's Todd, you know, I'm Supreet. He's so low key. He's so awesome. He's like, all right, I'll do it. And then we started and thus the name Zen parenting radio. That's how long we've been doing this. We didn't even, we thought it was radio. Like we were like, <laughs> Oh, um, you know, so that's where the, you know, when people are like, why do you have radio on the end? I'm like, that's how old this is. Um, but we started and we love it for so many reasons. Um, because of what you just said, which is we are students of life. We are students of parenting. Um, because just when you think you understand parenting, your kids change, right? It's not like you ever hold them at a certain place and, and you're like, now I get it. Like it's constantly changing. We are students of our relationship. Um, we are students of the world of global issues. Like we are constantly learning, changing and evolving. So we never run out of things to talk about, which my children will attest. They're like, can you guys stop talking? Um, and as you know, we don't always agree. We're, we, we're not arguers, but we definitely have different perspectives on things, which I think makes for a nice combination. I think it's a little more harmonious because he helps me see things a certain way and I help him see things a certain way. And that's what partnership is, right? So that's how we began. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So on a recent podcast uh, of yours, you when you shared that you are coming out with this book on Zen parenting, I was beyond excited because I love parenting books and I do a lot of book reviews and book summaries on my channel. So I was like, okay, I have to read this book and I cannot wait to do that and absorb all the wisdom that you have to offer. So what is this book about and who is this for? 
Oh, that's a great question. This book is, I mean, it's had a, a lot of iterations because I actually started this process like four years ago. And honestly, the first version of the book, like the book that that I, the proposal that I initially created was a lot more of like a day book, like essays of how to look at things, um, you know, through the perspective of connection and self-awareness and mindfulness. It was more like, this is how it looks in theory, you know, like, here's the things I'm talking about. This is how it shows up a little like our show. Um, but then it, I mean, I'll totally be honest with you. I went the traditional, traditional publishing route and I got a ton of rejection like rejection, rejection, you know, like my agent was wonderful to me, but a lot of publishers were like, ah, I don't think so. So but did there, J.K. Rowling with her? I, her I know. Books? Well, yeah. and that's the thing is, Supreet, it kind of became a funny thing in my family because my kids knew what I was doing. And I had published three books before, but basically they were all self-published or the third one was with a small publisher. And this was the first really venture out into the world of rejection, right? Like I knew what I was getting into. I knew that not everybody's going to love what I had. You know, it's just, I always kind of connect it to being like an actor or an actress, which I'm not, but you know, you go out for a role and you're not going to be right for every role. Like yeah. that's just kind of the way of things. And so when I would get a rejection, I would like come upstairs and read it to everybody. I'd be like, okay, here's the rejection of the day. But I knew I was going to get this done. Meaning I was going to take advice from people. I was going to talk to my agent about it. And so basically what um, it ended up becoming was instead of an essay book or a day book, it became a very traditional chapter book. So I had to figure out how to talk about all these things, but put it in a format that was clean and, and made sense and people could follow. Cause sometimes I read books where I'm like you, I love, I love books, but sometimes there's so much information. You're like, I don't know how to track this. And I really wanted to come up with a way to discuss this. And I ended up using, um, the, the format of the chakras. And I say the format, because even though as a yoga teacher and as somebody who like, I, you know, had a lot of body work in my life, a lot of Reiki, I'm very, you know, into those kind of, you know, treatments or holistic awareness, you don't have to fully understand the chakras to understand like the scaffolding of the chakras, which is basically like, these are the, these energy centers in our body, they represent these things. And even if you don't want to buy into that, these are all the pieces of the puzzle that connect to make parenting not so daunting. And it helps us live a life that we end up role modeling for our children, not because we're doing it perfectly, nothing like that, but because we are doing our best to show up as human beings and and demonstrate resilience and, and fail and understand why and handle rejection, you know, all the pieces of life. And so we get to live our life in a way that we feel in our integrity. And then therefore our children learn how to do the same. So that's what it eventually turned into, which, um, I'm, you know, I'm very, I'm very pleased. Like it was a lot to fit in to a small amount of space. And then at the beginning of the book, before I get into the chakras, I talk about things that are really to me, important in understanding our world and as a whole of being a global citizen, you know, discussing race, discussing inequality, discussing sex education, um, discussing dignity and things that before we even jump into ourselves, let's kind of get a whole picture about how we want to, what we're really trying to do, which is reconnect with ourselves and others, um, create a sense of peace, um, and live what we're trying to teach. Wow. So it's almost like building the foundation first before constructing the building. You got it. It's in that is, and it's funny if I had more information about construction and I was smarter in the world of engineering, I probably would have used that, you know, like some kind of other metaphor besides chakras, but I'm a yogi always have been. And it's the way I see people, you know, um, it's the way I see how we work from the inside. And I also use a lot of Western, you know, I'm a trained therapist. And so I use a lot of Western philosophy as well. A lot of research, a lot of theory. Um, but I like the blend of the two. Me too. I think, um, in a lot of people that I follow and I read their books, I love it when they combine the Western science and research with, um, with the Eastern spirituality and wisdom. And I am myself exactly the same. I'm a, uh, an engineer by background. So I'm very, very science focused and I love science and I love research and the reasons behind things. So very left brained to begin with. Yeah. Uh, but then in my, uh, in my mid thirties and when my dad passed away, I sort of, uh, 
tried to read more spiritual books and that helped me to become a little bit more right brain which mm -hmm. like sometimes even i'm i think my 20 year old version would be so surprised if she could see the the current me <laughs> and now like i am yeah i am like yeah definitely a mix of east and west myself now well, and Supriti, I love that. Thank you for sharing that because we have that. It's a similar overlap, a little different because I think when I came in I, and who knows, like, it's so hard to know these things, but I was so right brain that I had to get a grip. Like I, I, I always say to Todd, I could have floated off the earth. Like I just, <laughs> everything to me seemed mystical. And, you know, I was so sensitive as a kid and things that in no way am I embarrassed or ashamed of, but I really had to find a sense of grounding and theory and science and becoming a therapist and having that Western model really helped me understand, you know, developing an understanding of psychology and history. And, and that really kind of helped, you know, it's like, we kind of did like opposite things, but then there was a time that I got really involved in being a therapist where I kind of only focused on Western and I had to bring that piece of me back in, you know, that spiritual mystical kind of, you know, seeker, um, back in. And, and also that was a lot about my dad too. When my dad was sick and he passed away a lot of the, you know, when it came to death and mortality and caring for people who used to care for us, you know, like switching roles, like a lot of pain, led to me finding, refinding, rediscovering those parts of myself. Yeah, I think uh, for a lot of people, they find spirituality through pain. Yeah. And uh, one thing I wanted to go back to when you were sharing your story about the book, and I really um, appreciate and admire you for being so open and vulnerable with talking about your rejections. Mm. And also like when you said, you know, I'm sharing with my kids that this is the rejection of the day, I feel like what an amazing um, way to share with your kids and teach them that failing is okay. And, you know, you're being a great role model for your kids that you're actually celebrating your failures, which I think is, uh, you're an awesome parent for, for showing your kids that. Well, thank you. And I will share this just so if people are like, oh, I don't know if I'd want to do that. The reason that I self-published my first two books is because I wasn't ready for rejection. I was still developing my own understanding. And if other people would have come back and said, this isn't right, or this is wrong, I would have been heavily influenced by that. Meaning I would have felt less than I didn't have the tolerance for rejection yet. And now I turned 50 this year. And I started this book, like I said, four years ago, when my oldest daughter was a freshman in high school. And I remember exactly the moment being like, I'm ready for a team. Like I was ready for an agent and a, and a publisher. I'm ready to hear other people's opinion about what I do, meaning that I have a good foundation now where I'm ready to hear other, you know, feedback about what have you considered this? Have you considered this? And I kind of have always done that, but I mean, on a more like out there platform, you know, where like other people are watching. Um, and I was ready. Um, and that's why it made it easier for me to, to share you know, so openly, cause the girls knew what I was going into. Like, I'm like, you guys, this is going to be a little, this might be a little brutal initially. And it, and it was, and, but I knew like the bottom line is I knew I was going to get this book published. And just like my agent kept saying to me, it only takes one Kathy. Like, it's not like you have to prove to every publisher and everybody out there, it takes one. And then you find your team, which I'm so pleased to have, they're fantastic. And, and then you, it begins, you know, and you go out there and you, you listen and talk to people. Like I just have so enjoyed hearing other people's feedback and perspectives about this because we don't agree on everything, but that's okay. Like I'm so much more open-minded than I think I was as we all are 10 years ago, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and also you probably value external internal validation more than external, right? That's uh, Absolutely. one of the beautiful things about aging, isn't it? Absolutely. So a um, final question would be, um, where can people, is it available for pre-ordering at the moment? It is. So okay. you can, you yeah. can go to zenparentingbook.com or our website, zenparentingradio.com. Either is fine. And you can basically, when you click pre-order, it gives you every option under the sun, an indie bookstore, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. So you can order it from where you want to get it. And then when it comes out, then it should be available everywhere for purchase, right? No you matter, no matter the location. 
no okay. matter the location, it should be available everywhere. It should be in the libraries. It should be in the bookstores. It should be online. And I also, um, I'm reading my own audiobook. I actually do that next Oh, week. wonderful. Yeah. So I was excited to get that opportunity because for people who listen to the show, I would want them to hear my voice. You know, that's kind of how they know me. So I I'm love your the voice. audiobook next week. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then um, in the meantime, until your book is ready to be read, where can people follow you or listen to you or look at your other work? Great question. Thank you. Zenparentingradio.com has everything, like everything that we do. And I would say the most important things are our podcast, which you can get on any podcast app. Zen highly, Parenting recommend, Radio. highly recommend that podcast. Thank you so much. And it's on every app you can think of. So that is, you know, you can find that show. Um, I also put out a, like a once a week newsletter. Um, it's not even a newsletter. It's like a, it's like an essay about how to, um, practice these things that we talk about on the show. It's usually a story about one of my kids or about me. Um, and that is called Zen parenting moment. Um, yes. and so on our website, you can just, you know, put in your email again, there's nothing but the, just put in your email and your name and you'll get that for free. And then we do have something called Team Zen, which is our community of listeners who like to ask questions or be in community with each other. And as you know, from the show, Supreet, like it's not as if we are giving absolute answers to anything. Um, but sometimes when someone's struggling and they start to share about it, other people in our community have similar experience. So they can, if not help each other literally with resources, they can at least have each other to discuss or Todd and I can facilitate that. So team Zen is also on Zen parenting radio, uh, dot com. So that's probably the the place to find everything we do. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for all the amazing work that you do to help others and other parents and other families. And once again, I am so honored to have you as my guest. Thank you for uh, coming on and taking out your time and wish to see you in person one day. I hope so too, Supri. Thank you for listening and thank you for having me. It was really fun. Yeah. Hi. Good. I am still, Todd's here with me and he's just helping my connect my speakers. So I will be with you in a second. Yeah, no worries. My husband's here too. And he's my tech support as well. <laughs> <laughs> I love that both our husbands are helping us. It's I know. Okay. It's All right. So thank you so much. Okay. Now you can close the door. Sure. Yeah.